are the big thing. But I tell you what, I like singing some of the old hymns once in a while. More often than that, we do, actually. And we're going to sing one of the old hymns right now that I'm sure you know. We'll stand with me as we sing. There's power in the blood.
to be about your work of spreading the gospel and spreading the great news to those around us. We are thankful for the opportunity that you give us to be part of that and you allow us to work by your spirit and by your power. Father, humbly we come before the throne of grace this morning to seek you. Father, more importantly, to find you. We just pray as we are here and as we're gathered that we will be aware of your presence, that we will be following the Spirit. be open to your word, and then we will allow your word to penetrate us, and to change us. Father, we have so much to be thankful for. One of those things is that you are in control. Father, we come today and we pray for our governments at all levels, local, provincial, federal. We just ask that you would be with them. <coughs> that you would be leading what they are doing and that you would be guiding them and directing them. And Father, that you would be placing in leadership those who would be ruling over us with, with your grace and your authority. We <coughs> pray your blessing upon those in leadership roles and trust that you will be working all things out for your glory. And as camps have started, <coughs> Father, for the leaders, for those who have spent so much time planning for the summer activities and now it has begun. We just pray that you will be strengthening all of those leaders who are there. That you will be giving them the energy and the desire to carry on and continue. And Father, that you would be at work the lives of all those young people who were there. For just a nod or a stirring that they may hear you speak. That they may feel your touch. And that through those that you have placed there to work this summer, that they would see the love of Christ shine through all those who you have placed at camps. Father, so many lives get changed through that experience. So many seeds are sown. We just pray that you will bless that ministry as you already have. But that you would just do so in great abundance. We pray for this church, Lord, as we gather here each week, and, and we like to think in the summertime that we're on break or on vacation, but Father, your work never ends. And while it is great to have a vacation and to take some time, Father, just help us as a church to make sure that we are taking the time not just to rest and relax on our own, but to rest and relax in you. To be refreshed and renewed through you. And Father, we just pray this summer as we do that, that you would be giving us clearer vision for the future, in our 
hearts that which you would have us to do come fall. May we be diligently seeking your way through prayer. May we be willing to do what you call us to do. No matter how uncomfortable or difficult that may be. And no matter what you call us to do, you will never call us into something that you haven't already gone before us and made the path. Father, we pray for all those in their community today. We just pray that your spirit will be working. Father, that those who are not here this morning that don't know you, that you would be sending in their lives those people who would just give them a little, a little nugget for them to, to chew on. That the spirit would cause a stirring in this community and in the souls of those who do not know you yet. Father, that we may see a revival of the excitement and the joy of the Holy Spirit and of the Son, Jesus Christ, in this community. We thank you for what you have done, what you no doubt will continue to do. We praise you what you have given us. And as we come here this morning, Father, I hope that we have come longing with expectancy to meet you in this place today and to be open to be touched by you. Thank you for the privilege of coming this morning to celebrate communion. We thank you for the perfect plan of salvation. In your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that while you gave it all, may we give all we have to give to you. Bless us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to remind you, if you have kids uh, five years old or younger, that there is a continued program for them. For those of you who are older than five and stuck here listening to me, I'm sorry, but I'm sure you've done worse sitting in school sometimes. I'm sure you can get through my 15 or 20 minutes of blabber. You know, it's amazing how God works. Uh, as I was listening to what Angela said, and the call for worship, and what Jeff just prayed, it's amazing, and the song sung, how it all fits together some weeks. And uh, this morning, I think it just fits together so beautifully. And I trust God will uh, bless our hearts as we listen to the word this morning. We're looking at Mark chapter 5, we're moving along in, our, uh, in the book of Mark, and we're going to look at uh, verses 1 to 20, which encapsulates one full story. Mark chapter 5. They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the, mort and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other? Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I implore you by God, 
do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned. The herdsmen ran away and reported it to the city and the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had the demon possessed, sitting down, clothed in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore him to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him, but he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. What a terrific story. And there are so many gems we could pull out of there this morning. Uh, I just have to narrow it down a little bit this morning and uh, trust we'll be blessed in the Lord. The story is told of a friend and an associate of boxers in days gone by. American writer Wilson Misner was himself a talented fighter. And one night Misner and boxer friend mysterious Billy Smith were visiting a San Francisco bar where Misner started a fight with some longshoremen. At the end only one longshoreman was left standing. Although Misner had rained punches at him, he stayed obstinately upright. He would not fall. Suddenly, mysterious Billy Smith said, notice what was happening. He said, leave him alone, Wilson, he shouted. I knocked him out five minutes ago. And on our investigation, it turned out that a punch from Smith had indeed knocked the Lord Sherman out cold but had also wedged him vertically between two pieces of furniture. Uh, and really, that is an accurate picture of our already defeated but still standing enemy, <coughs> Satan himself. He's defeated. <coughs> Indeed, Satan is a formidable foe. And I think too often, especially... Uh, those of us who walk with the Lord for a long time, we may underestimate His ability to influence our lives for uh, his, his glory. And His goal is to bring as many people down to hell with Him as, he as many as He possibly can. And He is all about lying, He's about deceit, He's about harm, He's about anger, revenge, and virtually anything that is evil. He is the author of all these things. And his desire is to pull us into his web of lies and take us away from Christ. And let's be honest, he's doing a pretty bang up job, isn't he? People are turning away from God today in droves, not understanding that all Satan wants to do is to destroy them. And God, on the other hand, wants to do nothing more than to give us love and life and happiness and joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in our story today, we have a story that illustrates this problem. It is a rather extreme case of demonic involvement but it sure hit, hits home as to what Satan wants to do in so many lives as opposed to what Christ wants to do for us. 
I see in our story a story of contrast. What Satan wants to do and what God wants to do. And I want to focus on that today. The contrast Satan's plan with God's plan. Last year you may recall that it was the end of the day for Jesus and he was exhausted and they were heading down the Sea of Galilee uh, in a boat and Jesus was sleeping in the midst of a terrible storm. He was so exhausted. Mark tells us that Jesus gets off the boat and once again something is waiting for Jesus or someone rather is waiting for Jesus on the other side. We don't know if Jesus arrived there in the middle of the night or if it had the whole night had transpired their trip. We don't know. But Jesus arrives there and uh, meets this man. And what meets him is a demon possessed man. Today, many are very skeptical about matters concerning demon possession, especially those in the psychology field. But I, for one, have no hesitancy in saying that demon possession is a reality. Ask anyone, and I've met people who've come out of occultic practices, and they will tell you it is a real thing. And they will bear witness to the power that is found in demon possession. Now here's something we need to understand. Demon possession has all kinds of levels. It doesn't look like one thing. One can argue if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can, some people will say that person's demon possessed. Others feel there is much more to it than to demon possession than just simply not being a Christian. And I don't pretend to stand here and be able to give you a definitive answer or a definitive picture as to what demon possession looks like, because I think it looks like a lot of things. But this I do know. There is demon possession. It begins in small little ways in our lives. It begins with compromises in life. It begins by not censoring what you watch on TV. It begins for some with playing with different kinds of cars. With others, it begins with alcohol. For some, it begins with playing with a Ouija board. I still can't believe Ouija boards are put in the game sections and toy departments. I find that just amazing. For some, it begins with visiting fortune tellers. I read somewhere that the number one book checked out of high school libraries all have to do with the occult. High school libraries. When I was in EA in the school, as most of you know I was, I can't tell you the amount of times the kids, even in middle school, were telling me things they were doing occult related. It was unbelievable. This man in our story today began by dabbling in the occult. He tells us he was spending a lot of time in the graveyard. You know, a lot of teenagers like to go to the graveyard, especially at Halloween at nighttime, doing seances and all kinds of <coughs> things like that. Friends, the occult is real, and it is not a game. It is not something to be laughed at. It is not funny. It is that we should not have our palms red. Going to tarot card readers, these things are occultic in practice, and we should not be involved with them. Don't dabble <coughs> in these things. Hollywood is just grasping at occultic stuff. There's so many things on TV about the paranormal, about demon possession. It's unbelievable. Oprah Winfrey used to have all kinds of speakers come in, reading their reading <coughs> people of the past, or I don't know what they called it anymore, but crossing over they called it. And Dr. Phil does it all the time too. Always bringing on people to help read your past. And these things are not harmless. They're not just fun and entertainment. They're serious things in the eyes of God. 
So what am I trying to say? Folks, we need to be careful with our lives. Satan will tempt us in things and tell us it's just fun. Relax. It's okay. But at the end of the day, Satan wants to destroy us. Jesus wants to save us. Jesus wants to take us out of this world and bring us to a new heaven for which he has gone to prepare a place for us. He wants to give your life fullness and joy and blessing. He wants to give you joy in your daily walk. He wants to bless you and make you a blessing to other people as well. God wants good for you. Satan wants to lie to you and tell you that he is much more powerful and he wants to give you an instant, a life of instant pleasure and satisfaction, but will lead you away from God. Be careful with your life. Be careful with what things are molding and shaping who you are as a person. What, may I ask, perhaps may be dishonoring God in your life today? I want you to think about that. What is dishonoring God in your life? God wants your life. He wants you to pick up your cross daily and follow Him. But guess what? Satan wants your life as well. He wants to pull you away. He wants to give you a life of pleasure. Don't get me wrong. And He wants to give you power. But it's all false. It's all smoke and mirrors to pull you away from God. And I want to talk this morning specifically for us Christians this morning. Are we compromising our lives? Have we laid down the cross that Christ has asked us to pick up and carry? Who are our circle of friends who influence us and shape our lives? What is it? that takes our time socially. Let us pick up the cross. Let us choose that no longer will we allow Satan to lead us into the traps that will not bring glory to God in our lives. This morning, I'm not going to mention anything in particular that may be pulling us away from God because I'm going to let God's Holy Spirit talk to your life, not me. Uh, it is God's Spirit who will do the convicting this morning. But my point is, folks, as Christians, we need to wake up. Let's live with no compromises. The second thing I want us to notice is the power of the devil has to offer Make no mistake about it, power is a reason why many young people get involved with the occult. Satan promises them power. And it is true, there is power in the occult. Don't get me wrong. This man in our story, it says he was able to break chains even. It sounds like he wasn't the kind of guy you'd want to go passing by either. Because he would take care of you. You know, pride is what brought down Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They wanted to be like God. They wanted, so they thought, was God's power. Many kids who are social outcasts get involved with the occult because of the power it brings them. There's power in the devil. But his power is a lie in itself. His power is to pull you away from God. William Lane said this, and I thought this was so fantastic. The function of demon possession is to distort and destroy the image of God in man. Hear that again. The function of demon possession is to distort and destroy the image of God in man. And of course, the opposite blessing we have is the image of the Holy Spirit. 
seal upon our lives. And the changing grace the Spirit of God has on us. And I'm not saying this morning that the Holy Spirit is in this uh, game of uh, who's more powerful. Because I don't think that's what he's involved with. Uh, I don't think he needs to do that. When I lived in Saskatchewan many years ago, I was told of a story of the, this person who was involved in the occult. And uh, he would walk the streets and he would go into different houses and he would pray curses over the houses. And don't get me wrong, things happen. And when he came to a house that was a house of a Christian, where prayer was predominant in that home, somehow he was able to see angels surrounding and protecting that home. Now I can't tell you if that story is 100% true or not. It is a story I heard secondhand. But much like our story, when the demon saw Jesus far off, he ran and he bowed before the Savior because he knew who Jesus was. Satan offers fake power and he offers fake satisfaction. It is all a lie to pull us from God, to bring us to hell. And of course the contrast is the Holy Spirit who lives within us. He wants to grow us. He is the great comforter. He is the counselor within us. He gives us the strength and the ability to fight off the devil. Do you realize that you have the power within you over evil spirits? It's in you. And like the disciples, you have within you the power to cast out demons in Jesus' name. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. There's power in the Holy Spirit. And though this, through the Spirit the people have been healed, through the Spirit people have been raised from the dead, through the Spirit people have spoken in tongues, and through the Spirit we are given life, and, and our life has been changed because of the Spirit of God that lives within us. The third thing I want to draw to our attention is the destruction the devil ultimately wants of our lives. Verse 5 says, look at this, so, so key verse, constantly night and day he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. That's what the devil wants to do to each of us. He wants to destroy us. He wants evil to come into you <coughs> and harm you. At first, it may seem like fun and games, but don't kid yourself, he has an ultimate plan for our destruction. But for, but for God's grace, this man in our story today would have went to hell in the condition that he was in, but God intervened through Jesus Christ. And Satan is so pleased, folks, when we compromise our values and who we are as Christians. He loves it. Evil, evil, evil is the intent that he has for each and every one of us. So is there hope? Can we fight the foe? Jesus said, I come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life you in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And he also says those famous words that we all know so well for God so loved the world, and he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Satan wants us to compromise and destroy our lives. Do you see in this story how Satan is determined to destroy this child? God. This man was utterly destitute. And that's what he wants for each of us. But for God's grace, but for the Holy Spirit who indwells us, we need to be careful with our lives. And then check out verse 6. 
He says, Jesus, seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed before him. I find that an interesting little tidbit of information. Does it remind you of another story in the Bible, perhaps? How about the prodigal son? The son runs off and is welcomed back by his father. And while the son is still far off, his father runs and welcomes him home. But we have an interesting twist in our story today, don't we? In this story, the devil is running to Jesus. He knew who Jesus was. I didn't know this, but scholars say that because of the way Satan addressed Jesus when he said, what business do we have with each other? It's Jesus, Son of the Most High God. It was really a challenge. I didn't understand that uh, until I read it this week. He was challenging Jesus' authority. He was trying to intimidate Jesus. We don't see that in the English. He was trying to get an upper hand in the argument, you might say. At the same time, understanding what Satan was saying in his address, he is not addressing Jesus as the messianic designation we often hear. He was addressing him as the divine one. He knew who Jesus was. He knows what's going to happen to him and his host of angels when the day final, finally comes and Jesus returns. And he wants to take as many of us away from God as possible. He wants to take us on for a ride. Here's the thing. Though there is no exact definition, you might say, of a demon-possessed person, I think it is clear that there are various degrees to which Satan has hold of our lives. Even us as Christians, we have those two natures within us. The obvious result of that is that we can, are controlled by both natures. We also have the Holy Spirit living in us. And just as the devil has various degrees of control over people's lives, so does the Holy Spirit have various degrees of control over our lives. Actually, better stated, the devil wants control, but God wants us to be obedient unto him. So that begs the question of us Christians. Are we living a life of compromise? Have we allowed things in our lives to take us away from the full blessing that Jesus wants to bestow upon us through the Holy Spirit? Or something that we really don't need in our lives? As I said, there's lots we could pull out of this story, but I want to skip to the end of the story today. This man who would Jesus save, Jesus casts out the demons, and he wants to follow Jesus. He wants to be alongside him, telling others of the wonderful grace that God had bestowed upon him. Jesus tells him to go home and tell his friends of God's mercy upon his life. We all know this. There is a marked difference in the lives of those who have been raised in the church and for those who come to Jesus Christ later on in their lives. Those who come later on in life have a, a real sense of God's wonderful grace and changing power in their lives. And they often want to tell their friends that uh, they have been changed by the power of God. For those of us who are raised in the church, we kind of often miss that. Deep down, many of us don't want new believers to become like us even. We become too self. We don't want them to lose the fire that we have lost. But you know what? Here's the good news. It doesn't need to be that way. Never forget that the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. 
But here's the thing. Like I said earlier, the Holy Spirit has different degrees of, of uh, effect or control over a person. Our growth is solely dependent upon our obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't stand up here today and say, you know what? You shouldn't be drinking. You know what? You shouldn't play cards. You know what? You should do this or that or whatever. There are a million things we can stand up here and say, oh, we shouldn't do those things. I'm not going to do that this morning. Let's leave it to the Spirit of God to talk to our hearts. So how much of our life does the Holy Spirit truly have of each of us? Is there much compromise in our lives? You know, usually when altar calls are given, we call for the unsaved to come forward, and we as Christians sit back and say, Oh, I hope and pray they come forward. So it's all comes forward. Today I'm asking us, Christian, is God speaking to us about something for which we are compromising? I'm going to ask you to come forward today. Share with me what it is. Be accountable. You know the Catholic Church has those confessional booths. Now, I don't believe a priest can forgive any sins, but the act of confession, the act of accountability, is good. I'm not asking you to come forward and you make a spectacle of yourself. But we need accountability. We need the prayers and love of the Church of God. And if truth be told, if truth be told, there probably isn't any of us here who doesn't need to surrender a little more to the Lord Jesus Christ. Literally all of us can come forward. But I'm just asking today, if God is talking about something in your life, you want to share it and receive prayers and blessings. Come forward. I'm not going to judge anybody. Or is anybody else here going to judge anybody? I want to pray for you, and I promise I will not share it with anybody else. Will you come? I'm going to invite the worship team up at this time, and uh, we'll have a closing song. And as they come, let's just have a good time. Father, as we learn today, the devil is real. And he wants nothing more than to destroy our lives. And yet, at the same time, the Holy Spirit of God lives in us. He gives us our life and hope. And Lord, I don't know what the hearts of everybody here is this morning. But I pray all of us are convicted of something this morning. And if you want somebody to come forward, may you spur them so they can't sit still. And come to the front. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing the song.